Health, this is Ask Us Anything About Bipolar Disorder. I'm Scott Gilbert. Life is a series of ups and downs, happiness followed by sadness. That's normal. But how do we know when either of those moods may last for a week or more? How do we know if it may indicate something more severe, perhaps we're having trouble staying focused or even having trouble sleeping. That may indicate bipolar disorder, also referred to as manic depression. Here to talk with us about that today is Dr. Erica Saunders. She's chair of psychiatry here at Penn State Health, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Dr. Saunders, appreciate your time today. Let's start by talking about the fact that we all feel happy sometimes and sad sometimes. That's a, that's a matter of life. So how do I know if it's possibly a, a more serious series of ups and downs I'm experiencing. Thank you for having me today, Scott. That's a very good question because, of course, we all have ups and downs in our moods, and we actually need that to, uh, to think well, to make good decisions about our life. We need to have that emotional reaction, and that's perfectly normal. Um, the problem that, uh, that is experienced in bipolar disorder and in depression is that uh, the moods get stuck outside of that normal range. So usually you wake up in the morning if you happen to wake up on the wrong side of the bed and have a have a low mood um, you might do something even without even realizing it to make yourself feel better I like to have a hot cup of something in the morning mm -hmm. um, you might talk to somebody that you love that sort of thing and it might make you feel better um, but when the biological processes start in the brain that uh, lead to bipolar disorder uh, the moods get stuck outside of that normal range and the usual things that you want to do to help yourself feel better uh, to make yourself uh, feel less anxious, more co to concentrate better, just don't work. Mm -hmm. um, and we know from research that uh, actually the parts of the brain that control thinking and cognition and the parts of the brain that control emotion aren't as well connected uh, when there's an active depression or mania going on. Mm -hmm. So as a clinician, how do you diagnose something like bipolar disorder? What are some of the things you look for? So the first thing that we ask about is mood. Uh, a low mood, feeling sad, feeling down, depressed, or being unable to enjoy things, which we call anhedonia. Uh, those are problematic uh, moods that if they last long enough or cause significant enough problems in somebody's life, we are concerned about. Um, the other type of mood that uh, we ask about and is important in bipolar disorder um, is a mood that's too high, too elevated, uh, where people feel um, uh, perhaps so much energy, um, so, uh, so revved up that they can't think and make good decisions for themselves and for those around them. Um, and uh, in that case, that's called um, a hypomania or mania. Um, so we ask about mood specifically, but the other things that are affected um, include sleep, appetite, energy, concentration, memory. Um, so it's really a, a constellation of, of problems that, of course, affect people's functioning. We're talking about periods of mania and periods of depression. Well, I'm less likely to seek clinical help, of course, if I'm feeling fantastic, even if I'm feeling way up, perhaps. So I would think that the fact that people may seek more treatment more often when they feel depressed, could that possibly lead to a misdiagnosis of depression if the clinician's not careful? Absolutely, absolutely. And so bipolar disorder can present for the first time as depression. Um, and uh, so a good assessment and evaluation will ask about all types of moods that a person has experienced in their life if they become problematic. Sometimes uh, when somebody is experiencing an elevated mood that's abnormal, they may not realize it. And loved ones in their life may um, help them to understand that there's something that could be um, problematic. Sometimes an eleva even an elevated mood can be uncomfortable um, and, and a person might, might actually realize it themselves. Could, it could be either one. Okay. You're watching Ask Us Anything About Bipolar Disorder from Penn State Health, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. I'm Scott Gilbert. This is Dr. Erica Saunders. She's chair of psychiatry here. She welcomes your questions. You can add them as a comment below this Facebook post, whether you're watching this live here on Friday or if you're watching it after the fact. We can still track down an answer to your question, so feel free to ask away in the comment field below this post. And of course, if you find this information useful, we hope that you'll share it on your Facebook page. Um, Dr. Saunders, at what age does bipolar disorder typically get diagnosed? When does it become most noticeable? Most people who experience bipolar disorder uh, begin to have problems during the teen years um, with moods uh, and often with anxiety as well. Uh, so low mood, high mood, as we talked about before. Um, but generally the age between 15 and 25 is the most common age that, uh, that this becomes problematic for, for an individual. Mm -hmm. 
And we talked about some of the things that clinicians look for, but what are some things that family members, friends can look for, or some warning signs that, you know, they, you may know somebody for a while. You may know them as someone who's happy, sometimes sad, sometimes. But what's that sign that maybe your loved one might need some help? Um, the problems with relationships um, and problems with um, uh, uh, social functioning in general that might relate to feeling down or feeling too high and excited that people aren't able to really interact. Um, th those are warning signs. Uh, in, in depression, um, unfortunately, people can feel so hopeless and sad uh, that they may not think that things will ever get better, and that can lead to thoughts of suicide, and that, of course, is a very um, attended to very quickly. As with many medical conditions, there are different types of bipolar disorder. It's not a, an across-the-board diagnosis necessarily. Can you walk us through briefly a couple of the different types? Certainly. Um, there are two types that we really talk about, bipolar 1 disorder and bipolar 2 disorder. Um, and the difference comes uh, in that bipolar 1 disorder um, has periods of what we call mania, which is uh, severe elevated mood. Um, and when I say elevated, it's not just happy. Um, but it's, um, it can be happy, it can also be um, uh, uncomfortable, but elevated energy, inability to sleep, inability to make good decisions, impulsivity, often leads to people doing things that they would never otherwise do that can get them into legal trouble um, and, uh, and be very dangerous. Uh, so that's mania, and that is the um, hallmark symptom or hallmark episode of bipolar 1 disorder. In bipolar 2 disorder, um, individuals experience what we call hypomania, which is elevated mood, but not to the severe extent that you can have in bipolar 1 disorder, um, and frequently uh, long and severe depression. We're learning about bipolar disorder today from Dr. Erica Saunders. She's chair of psychiatry here at Penn State Health, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. We welcome your questions. Just add them to the comment field below this Facebook post, and we'll pose them to Dr. Saunders either live or after the fact. We'll get you some answers as well. Now, Dr. Saunders is not just a clinician, but also a researcher, and uh, you had a recent study that found that while bipolar disorder occurs with similar frequency in men and women, there are some differences in how each gender experiences is episodes of mania or depression. Can you tell us a bit about that and why that's a significant finding? So that's something that we're very interested in. So bipolar disorder is uh, prevalent at about 1 to 2 percent in the population, um, equally, as you said, equally prevalent in men and women. Um, however, the experiences are different. And so what we found in a series of studies is that women tend to have more anxiety, uh, with bipolar disorder. Um, some studies have found that women have more depressive episodes, and we found that difficulty sleeping, um, even when people with bipolar disorder are feeling well or not in a depression or mania, um, can tend to be more problematic for women than for men. We're interested in this because um, there's different underlying biology that might be important for men and women, and we hope to really learn more about that so that we can better predict which treatments will match best for each individual patient. We really want to get to the point. We have a nice, we have, we have a, a, a number of different treatments for bipolar disorder, both medications and, and psychotherapy, and uh, we w really want to be able to predict early on in the course of illness which treatment is going to help which, which patient. So different biological causes depending on gender possibly. Possibly. So we're looking at different inflammatory factors that might be involved. The inflammatory system um, it has now been linked to a number of different um, conditions, including uh, obesity, uh, mood disorders, depression, bipolar disorder, um, perhaps others as well. And so we're looking at whether specific inflammatory um, changes in the body may um, be important or predictive of symptoms in men and women. Um, and that may tell us something in the future about what treatment is, uh, is best. Now, what do we know in general about the causes and risk factors for bipolar disorder? Uh, so we know um, uh, in general that one of the the biggest risk factors for bipolar disorder um, is that it runs in families, so it's what we call hereditary. Um, there's a genetic component to bipolar disorder, um, but it is not, um, uh, so it may pass from generation to generation, um, but it's not um, uh, something that's a certainty 
in a family. So, so if, if one of my parents has it, maybe I, then I'm not definitely going to have You're it. not definitely going to have it, but you have a higher risk than the general population mm -hmm. of having bipolar disorder. Um, so family history is, is um, a component of it. Um, there are uh, environmental factors that might um, lead someone to have, be more likely to have bipolar disorder, um, environmental triggers of, of mood, um, and uh, uh, then we know that there are a number of different biological systems that are involved. And there's a lot of really exciting research going on right now to try to understand um, what biological factors are important. We have a question online from Andrea, and this is something I think a lot of parents and grandparents can relate to. She says, my grandson is three, and there are times he goes on a rage, and then when you tell him no, then he goes and cries. Can you tell what could be wrong? So, I mean, is this possibly normal behavior for a three-year-old? Um, so that's a very good question, and um, uh, uh, so, so one of the things that we do when we evaluate people for um, bipolar disorder is to understand uh, at whatever age um, they are, uh, wh what is the usual behavior that's expected for that um, period of development. Um, and what might be abnormal behavior. Um, so there are a lot of different factors that can um, play a role in anger and in rage and in, in different moods um, at, at every stage of development. And so it's a little hard to say um, whether that's bipolar disorder specifically. Also, just taking that question a bit more general, um, when we uh, uh, look in, when we have children who are experiencing difficulties with mood, um, sometimes it can present a bit differently than, uh, than an adult. And so we have to understand um, what those uh, factors are for that individual child. And that's, that's part of an evaluation. And that's kind of related to a question we just got from Tara who's asking what the signs are of bipolar disorder specifically in children. So in children, um, uh, due to emotional development, children don't always uh, present with the same uh, the same words to describe emotional feelings it may be very difficult for children to describe their emotions, um, and uh, an emotional development happens in uh, you know in a progression um, throughout childhood. So uh, we look for disturbance in um, in school, uh, difficulty with grades, difficulty with social functioning, um, and then try to understand whatever moods that child is experiencing. What are they? What are they like? But you may not see the cla what we call the sort of classic euphoric or happy elevated mania that we see sometimes in adults. Um, for children, it might be more irritability, more anger, um, and more being just unable to control emotions. You're watching Ask Us Anything About Bipolar Disorder from Penn State Health, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. This is Dr. Erica Saunders. She's answering questions here today um, and some great questions so far, so thank you very much, and please keep the questions and comments coming. And I'd like to ask about what some of the consequences of bipolar disorder can be. That is, to what extent can this disrupt somebody's life? So the consequences can unfortunately be at times very, um, very severe. Uh, so as I said before, bipolar disorder can lead people to feel hopeless and feel like taking their own life, and that's a horrible tragedy that can be the outcome of this, um, of this severe illness. Um, additionally, people can have such difficulty at work or school that they're unable to continue with the job that they want or continue schooling, um, and difficulty in it can uh, be a problem in disrupting relationships. So um, uh, we uh, work very carefully with the patients and families that we see to understand what the impact has been of uh, mood problems on the, li on the life of that individual so far and do whatever we can to prevent um, having those types of problems in the future. Um, uh, we, we work to educate people about what, what is bipolar disorder, um, what steps can you take to improve uh, the, the, the mood functioning, and sometimes that's, that's of course, you know, focus of our treatment, mm -hmm. but um, there are also a lo lot of other ways that we help um, individuals with, uh, uh, with regulating, regulating mood. Uh, just I was going to ask about treatments a bit because uh, it seems like as with many uh, psychiatric conditions, there is uh, medication as an option, there's therapy as an option, and what kind of determines the, the, the path of treatment for a given patient? So we have medications for bipolar disorder, which we call mood stabilizing medications, which um, both treat manias and depressions and prevent future episodes. So this is an episodic illness. Um, 
where people tend to be affected for a while and then maybe not affected for a while. Um, and when you say a while, that's like a week or two sometimes, right? can be a week or two. It can be up to months. Um, and um, the natural course of the illness is to go into, into what we call remission, which is not to have any mood symptoms at that time, but then to come back and recur. And so we ha uh, uh, treatment with medication can help prevent future episodes, which is really important for overall health. Um, and for overall brain health. Um, uh, so, so there are a number of medications that can be helpful. Um, we also uh, use different types of psychotherapy, um, cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. There are a number of different types um, to match the situation that a patient might be experiencing. And that helps patients and, and, and families really build up um, the uh, resilience um, needed to deal with these devastating illnesses in their life and to, uh, uh, to regulate emotion. There are very well-tested, evidence-based techniques to um, help someone regulate emotion that we, we, that we teach. Is there a temptation among people who have bipolar disorder to maybe self-medicate with drugs, alcohol, even caffeine, and that extra cup of coffee? Absolutely. Um, you know, when, when any of us feel down, low, bad, angry, we try to do something to change that feeling. That's completely natural, and so many people turn to substances for that for that uh, for that same reason because um, substances do change how we feel. Unfortunately, that often becomes a vicious cycle, um, and substances that are commonly abused, alcohol, drugs of abuse, um, even caffeine at times, um, can set someone up for maybe maybe feeling better in the moment. But long term, it usually leads to much worse problems with mood, sleep, anger, irritability, um, and uh, sometimes can even uh, trigger addiction um, and, an, and a physical addiction dependent dependence process um, that is a separate illness but uh, also very severe. This is Ask Us Anything About Bipolar Disorder from Penn State Health. I'm Scott Gilbert alongside Dr. Erica Saunders. She's Chair of Psychiatry here at Penn State Health, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. She's been answering my questions and yours, and we welcome any additional questions you may have here as we bring things to a close. And of course, an important question is, if uh, people want more information, I understand they can go online to pennstatehealth.org slash psychiatry. Is that the best place to go? Yes, that's correct. So we provide services here through Penn State Health. We also have an affiliation with the Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute in Harrisburg um, that has services available there as well. Very robust psychiatry department, so uh, people can take advantage of those services, even if it's just a call and maybe uh, uh, learn a little bit more. Um, what should that first call be if somebody feels that maybe they personally might be experiencing this? Should they talk to their primary care physician or, or go beyond that? Um, so primary care physicians often uh, are a very good place uh, to, to start. Um, uh, so I would say primary care physicians, um, psychiatric specialty services, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, therapists, um, which can be, uh, so therapists can be nurses or social workers. Um, we all work together as a team to provide treatment uh, for, for patients and for individuals. Uh, if somebody's experiencing a crisis, um, there is a uh, crisis help in counties in Pennsylvania. Um, it's available through the county, um, the local emergency room for emergencies, um, and there are numerous um, helplines for uh, uh, suicide. Uh, if someone's experiencing thoughts of suicide, um, which is also a place to turn. A lot of places to turn for good information. Thank you. Thank you for the good information today, Dr. Saunders. Dr. Erica Saunders, she's Chair of Psychiatry here at Penn State Health, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. She was our guest. Thank you for being the viewers here for Ask Us Anything About Bipolar Disorder from Penn State Health.